All right, three round mock draft. Let's get into it. First one, it's Bijan, but where did he land? He went to the Eagles at pick 10, which, I mean, awesome landing spot, high powered offense, uh, great O line. The only downside is that Hertz might steal some goal line rushing TDs from time to time. But, I mean, this is a great landing spot, especially considering the Eagles should have positive game scripts on the regular for Bijan. Then at pick two, I'm going to go Stroud. He went at pick two itself after the Bears traded out of one to two and then traded out of two further back into the draft. So newsflash, Young went one. The Texans moved up, traded with the Bears. So we have Young going to the Texans and Stroud going to the Colts. I mean, that's that's just a straight up pick em to me. I'm leaning Stroud simply because it's a better situation. He has a better O-line, more weapons. But, I mean, if if you prefer Young, I can't really blame you. Uh, I think if the Texans had gotten more weapons for Young in this draft, I could justify it more. But in this draft, they don't really pick up any of the top-end wide receivers with their other pick because they traded up to one. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a difficult decision, but I'm leaning Stroud because at the end of the day, I can't – claim myself to be a quarterback expert. So when it comes down to it, I'm really taking quarterbacks based off their situation and kind of what they can walk into. You know, the better chance they have to succeed, regardless of talent, the better the pick they are in my eyes. So then we have Young at three, as I just explained. At four, we have Anthony Richardson, who goes to the Jets at pick 13. Now with the Jets, obviously amazing weapons. I don't really have to explain that too much to you. But he also has an amazing run game to lead on. Solid O-line, and obviously that rushing potential from Richardson pushes him above Levis, who went later in the draft. We'll get to him eventually for fantasy purposes. The next pick at five, we got Jameer Gibbs. Goes to the Raiders at pick 38. Now, with this pick, you obviously have to assume Jacob's gone. So Gibbs would have the backfield completely to himself. I mean, that's it. That's all you need to know. And whether the Raiders end up being good or bad, have a QB or not, Gibbs has full control of that backfield. He should have a high number of touches. He has great passing chops. So regardless of what you think of the Raiders, Gibbs will will be the backfield, period, on that team, which volume is something that you you have to take. It's simple as that. At the running position, like volume is, is king. Simple as that. Then at six, surprise here, I have Addison, first receiver off the board in this dynasty mock, not the first receiver off the board in the NFL mock that we're referring to. But he lands with the Bills at pick 20. Bills trade with the Seahawks to pick Jordan Addison. Now with Addison, I mean, he's not my number one receiver. I'm personally a JSN fan. But when you land with Josh Allen in the Buffalo Bills, I mean, that. He, I feel like he has to be pushed up. We'll talk about those other landing spots, but this is by far the best landing spot for those top three receivers. And, you know, if the Bills were to do this, it would basically signal, at least to me, the beginning of the end of Gabe Davis. I think by the end of his rookie season, Addison would be the entrenched number two and eventually become the number one when Diggs starts to decline as he gets older and older. Then at pick seven, we have Levis. So now we'll get to talk about his landing spot. He goes to the Panthers at pick five. They trade with the Seahawks. So the main the main problem here is I just I don't think the Panthers is a good situation. There's not many weapons. He really has DJ Moore and then nothing else. And I'm personally not too much of a Levis fan, but at pick five, he's guaranteed to be the starter for the entirety of his rookie deal. So I think in your actual dynasty drafts, if he were to go this high, if all these quarterbacks were to, get, were to get this high of capital, they probably all kind of go before Gibbs and Addison, realistically. Levis being my last one, he probably gets pushed up to five and those two slide down. But in my eyes, I'd I'd prefer Gibbs and Addison with these three landing spots amongst the three of them. Then pick eight, we got JSN. Lands with the Packers at pick 15. Now, JSN, by far my favorite wide receiver in this draft class. But 
QB situation in Green Bay is looking a little murky. You know, what is Rodgers going to do after the, the hat man talks to him in his darkness retreat? I have no idea. But you'd have to think if they do take JSN, Rodgers is still there. I mean, it would be a pretty... It, I'd understand why they would need weapons to support Jordan Love if he did leave, which is why they would take JSN, but it would just be a slap in the face to Rodgers if as soon as he leaves, they they take someone to help him out on the offense. Um, so if Rodgers stays, I feel like it's a little bit of a pick em again between him and Levis, JSN and Levis. Even though JSN is my favorite receiver in this class, as I said earlier with Addison, the value of Addison with Josh Allen long term has to outweigh my preference for JSN, even if Rodgers stays with the Packers. Now I'm sure all of you are waiting for him. Quentin Johnson goes to the Patriots in the second round at pick 46. Now with Johnston, I I thought about it a little bit and I feel like I'd almost prefer him if he went in the second round. Because Johnston has to be probably the most hyped in general simply because He's the, he's the physical specimen of the class, right? Like he's big, he's fast, and he can just go up and get it. So you have to figure if he goes in the first round, especially if he were to go, be the first receiver off the board, he's probably getting pushed pretty high in dynasty drafts. Whereas if he falls to the second and lands with a, a pretty solid landing spot, I think with the Patriots... I think there's kind of some value since he'll likely fall to this late first in your dynasty drafts. And with this Patriots landing spot, it's exciting and a little bit scary. I mean, it's exciting because there's massive opportunity. and It's scary because the Pats have such a poor history of drafting wide receivers. And obviously the concerns with Mack and the offense this last season. But I mean, there's major upside with this landing spot here. Now at 10, Hendon Hooker. Lands with the Seahawks at pick 52. Now, this, in my eyes, is an amazing landing spot. Great organization. Uh, he would have time to develop. I mean, I understand Hooker is old. I mean, he's, he was in college for a while. But the reason I love this spot so much is because he's not – there isn't pressure. He has some time to learn the offense, develop behind Geno Smith. And, I mean, he, he would come in with weapons. He would come in into a great offense after having time. So he'd obviously have a lot less time to fail compared to these quarterbacks that are ahead of him and have higher draft capital. But, I mean, I love this spot because he doesn't have to perform right away. 11, Tajay Spears goes to the Saints at pick 71. Now, before we get any further with this, I do need to remind you guys, running back scarcity is a thing. So even though these running back spots where they ended up in the draft aren't going to sound as good, obviously, as these other wide receivers that'll be behind him. Remember that running back scarcity is a thing. All right, Damian Pierce drafted at 107. He was going like early second, around like pick 14. James Cook went, I think, pick 63. He was going late first. Rashad White, pick 91. Algier, 151. So right now, these it's not going to sound great. Pick 71 doesn't sound great. But for running backs, that's good enough capital for us to push them up if they land in a good spot, which is exactly what happens with Spears here. Because in the short and long term, I mean, Alvin Kamara, what, what, what are we doing here, you know? Suspension looming. And the Saints have the potential out in the contract in 2024. So in the short term, Spears should likely – take the backfield this year with Kamara suspended. There's a chance next year the Saints move on from Kamara. I don't really see that as likely simply because of how the contract's broken down. It's almost, it's a lot more likely that they would move on from Kamara in 2025 or in 2024. I'm sorry. No, yeah. 2025, I believe. I don't have it up on me right now, but I'm pretty sure, yeah, it would be 2025 when they would move on. Uh think no it would be 2024 
Ignore me. You'll see it on the screen. You'll understand what the hell I'm talking about. Either way, Spears has opportunity in the short term, and if he impresses, Saints could move on from Kamara earlier than I expect them to. And then in the long term, Kamara's gone. Spears has the backfield opportunity. Volume is king. 12, we got Sean Tucker. Ends up with the Panthers, pick 93. Now, Dante Foreman is a free agent. It's only Chuba Hubbard and Raheem Blackshear are tied to the backfield. Massive opportunity for Tucker to take over the backfield. Simple as that. Marvin Mims ends up with the Cowboys, pick 58. I mean, pretty good landing spot. Opportunity to fill in the number two role in this offense right now. Tolbert and Gallup don't really inspire much confidence. And Mims has a solid production profile. So really like that landing spot. We're going to take him at 13. At 14, this is one of the guys that I told you about earlier, has that higher draft capital. But with wide receivers, draft capital doesn't matter as much. So Jalen Hyatt lands with the Ravens at pick 25. Now, the reason I have Hyatt so low, despite that first-round draft capital, is this is a low-volume passing offense. you got to assume with this pick that Lamar is still a Raven, and Hyatt now has to compete with Bateman and Andrews in a lower-volume offense. That's, that's not really, you know, inspiring a lot of confidence. The other fact, Hyatt is a fast guy, so he could be used more as a decoy to open up other players' routes underneath. Obviously, he'll obviously have the long ball occasionally that he takes to the house, but the reality is Hyatt would likely have more real-life value than fantasy value in this landing spot, so I just worry about his fantasy value being severely capped with the Ravens. Now... At 14, or 15, sorry, Lions take Michael Mayer at pick 18. Now, Mayer is a complete prospect. But what I'm going to say with every tight end that comes up, it's going to be the same thing. I will rarely ever take a rookie tight end because rookie tight ends don't produce. It's extremely rare that a rookie tight end is going to increase in value from where you draft them. And you can usually get them at a discount one to two years later. So if you believe in Mayer's long-term value, take them. Completely fine. Just don't expect fireworks year one. That said, it's a great landing spot. Next one, got another tight end right behind him. Dalton Kincaid with the Titans at pick 11. So with Kincaid, I've been seeing a lot of hype for him recently. And this landing spot confuses me a little bit. I mean, with Akunkwo, apologies if I pronounced that wrong, playing well as a rookie, it's a weird spot. Um, but if Kincaid were to get this level of capital, I, I'd i have to pair him as like a 1B tight end with Mayer. Uh, simply because Kincaid has a ton of potential. Zay Flowers, the next pick, he lands with the Saints at pick 40. So... Another strange landing spot here because we got the Michael Thomas scenario here. Now, Thomas did restructure his contract in a manner that, I mean, the Saints could still deal him. But the way that Thomas restructured his contract, at the worst, he I mean, he's assuredly gone the following year. I mean, there's no way that they hold on to him with the cap hit that he would have and the dead cap that they would have to eat, he, he would be, they would have to cut him. So, I mean, I would, if Thomas does stay, I wouldn't love Flowers year one, but I would be happy with it year two. The other problem is the Saints, I mean, what's going on at quarterback? They could land one of the guys that are in limbo right now, but, uh, I don't know, it, it is, it's strange, but at the end of the day, Zay Flowers, I mean, I like him. It's just this spot is it's a little strange. It's a little strange. Uh, then next at pick 18, we have Tyler Scott, who lands with the Giants at pick 57. Now, with Tyler Scott, kind of a name that I really haven't been paying much attention to, to be honest with you. Did some more research on him when I looked through this mock. Uh, he had a solid percentage of team receiving, receiving yardage this year, and he ends up in a deserted wide receiver room with the Giants. 
So even though he wasn't really a guy I'm, I was very interested in, the landing spot kind of pushes him up because there is opportunity for him. And then next, we have the Lions again taking Zach Charbonnet, pick 55. Now, there have been multiple mocks that have the Lions taking running backs. And there's even one, uh, Bijan, going to the Lions. Uh, Fantasy Flock Network covered that mock. I'll link to it in the description so you guys can check that one out. But this is, it's, it's weird how many, I mean, Lions taking a running back? I mean, maybe Swift is out in 2024. Maybe the Lions don't see him as a featured back. I mean, that's kind of what they've shown us. So with Charbonnet here, I mean, it would suck as a rookie. You'd have to assume they'd be done with Jamal Williams, which wouldn't make sense to me because in terms of a locker room presence, Jamal Williams seems to be very important for the Lions. So I'd be very surprised if they took Charbonnet. It, another weird one. And I, I especially don't love this landing spot because I also think they, the Lions wouldn't let Swift go. I feel like they would just turn it into a weird committee. I don't know. They, it's weird. So, straight up, it's weird. And I love Charbonnet as a prospect, so it sucks having him this low, but I'm just not in love with this landing spot. And then at 20, we have Kayshawn Butte Lands with the Falcons at pick 44. Another, another strange one. Uh... Not a bad one, I should say, because he's got some some pretty good competition. Kyle Pitts, Drake London, not really a quarterback that I have faith in aligned with the Falcons right now. And Butte really disappointed me this year. I was hoping to see a lot more. So unless the Falcons were to land the Caleb Williams sweepstakes, I really don't I don't love this landing spot for Butte. Regardless, next one, Rishi Rice lands with the Bears, pick 31. Now, with this one, I mean, I understand Rice gets first-round draft capital, goes pick 31. I understand that. But Rishi Rice is old. He'd be going into a – I mean, he was in college for a long time. He's not an early declare. Far from it. He'd be going into a lower-volume passing attack with the Bears – very high competition in my eyes with Claypool, Mooney, uh, Komet. Those aren't names that like are crazy good, obviously, but that's high competition for such a low volume passing offense. So unless you think that Fields is going to completely turn it around and just become a pass first player instead of the scrambler that he is right now, I just, I hate, I hate this. I hate this landing spot. I understand from an NFL perspective why Rice makes a lot of sense. Because he is older, you wouldn't have to spend as much time developing him. They want someone more developed already to just slot in and help Fields, you know, progress as a passer. But from a dynasty side, this is just gross to me. Regardless, next one, Kenny McIntosh, McIntosh lands with the Ravens at pick 100. I mean, Dobbins didn't look like the Dobbins we knew at times, a lot of times this last year. So I don't hate this landing spot at all. I mean, if, if Dobbins really never returns to what he was, there's opportunity here. Uh, McIntosh's production profile isn't amazing, but when you're a running back coming from Georgia – you can't really blame them for having low production earlier in the collegiate career. Georgia just pumps out NFL running backs. Uh, so even though he doesn't have an amazing production profile, we at least have a reason for it. Next at 23, I'm going Jaden Reed. Lands with the Chiefs at pick 95. This is a fast receiver going to the Chiefs. Now, Reed had a great junior year, disappointing season this last year seeing Keon Coleman kind of step up and take over. But with the Chiefs, I I don't know what to think of this wide receiver room. Presents both risk and opportunity, if you were to take Reed. Because, I mean, they traded for Tooney. They have Sky Moore. 
Who knows what goes on with Juju? MVS is still going to be there, probably. I mean, it's not going to disappear. I don't know what to think. Does Sky more massively improve year two? Does Tony become the first round receiver that he was taken to be? I don't know. Because if they both fail, Reed has amazing opportunity. It's. I don't know what to make of the Chiefs wide receiver room right now. But Reed has opportunity if he were to land there. Next, we got Cedric Tillman. Goes to the Cardinals. Pick 66. Now, five years in college is tough on the analytics side. You've seen me hate on these older prospects a lot in this mock. And with Tillman, he is in a good landing spot with the Cardinals and Hopkins potentially being traded. I just I don't know what to think. I don't know what to think. Good landing spot. I don't know if I, I don't know. I mean, if you like Tillman, let me know in the comments. I'm kind of 50-50 on him right now. I don't know what to think about him. The five years in college is just really tough for me to get over because the analytics hate it. Regardless, next one, Roshan Johnson. Steelers, pick 80. Another weird landing spot for these running backs. Obviously with Johnson, he played behind Bijan for his sophomore, junior, and senior season. So his weak production profile and him being a late declare, we have some reasoning for it. It's really a, a strange thing because you see a lot like Johnson can make great plays. So it's rare that you find a running back like this that was just a backup for his collegiate career and is still going to get good draft capital in, in the NFL draft, which Johnson probably will. So it, it, it's he's a strange prospect simply because of that, because his production profile isn't very impressive. And you initially might think this is a weird landing spot with Jalen Warren on the Steelers, but Warren and Najee, obviously. Warren had no draft investment, though. Makes him very replaceable, even though I think the Steelers staff really like him. If the Steelers were to take a running back in the third, I'd have to assume they'd have intentions intentions of Roshan taking almost all the snaps if Najee were to ever get hurt and relegating Warren to a limited third down rule. So with this, Johnson would basically just be a premium handcuff. Maybe some long-term value if he were to pan out and very impress and the Steelers were to decline Najee's fifth-year option two years from now, but I mean, it's impossible to forecast out two years from now. <laughs> so much changes in the NFL in just a year. Um, regardless, next one, pick 26, we have Darnell Washington. Carolina Panthers pick 39. Washington is a big boy. 6'7", hard to take down. He's pretty fast too for how big he is. And, you know, obviously at Georgia, he was competing not only with the wide receivers, but also with Brock Bowers. And with this landing spot with the Panthers, big target for Levis. Might go higher than this in your real dynasty draft. Just because he's a massive tight end that can scoot. He's pairing up with a rookie quarterback. Sounds like a pretty good narrative. Again, we'll be saying it a lot. Rookie tight ends don't produce, though. So you won't see me really taking, taking him too high. That's why he's ranked here. He'll probably go higher if he were to land that there in your draft. Next one, another tight end, Luke Musgrave. Texans at 33. He only played two games this year. He played well in those two games. Rookie tight ends, though. Next, we got Michael Wilson. Lands with the Browns. Pick 98. So... Wilson, another interesting prospect. As a sophomore, he led Stanford in receiving yards, but he's gotten hurt each of the past three years. So again, we have another older guy, but unlike some of these other older guys, again, he's a late declare for a reason. He kept getting hurt, wanted to put together another impressive season. And with the Browns, solid landing spot. I don't really know what to make of Donovan Peoples-Jones. 
he had a solid year this year. And then obviously you have Amari Cooper. You have, uh, who am I blanking on? I don't know why I'm blanking on the tight end. I own him on one of my teams. David Njoku. I don't know why I couldn't remember his name. Regardless, with those three, I don't know. I don't know. Peoples Jones is the real question mark for me. Can Wilson surpass Peoples Jones as the two second wide receiver in this offense? People behind all of them don't really impress me. I don't think Anthony Schwartz is ever going to become anything. So not a bad spot, especially if Watson can kind of get back to what he used to be. A lot of value there. And then we got Tanner McKee goes to the Lions. Yeah. Lions taking a third round quarterback, pick 81. Now with McKee, he has no rushing upside. But there is a chance... He could become the starter in offense with a lot of potential. But, major but, for every one Russell Wilson, you have 100, probably more than 100. You got a, a lot of Mason Rudolphs and Mike Glennons. QB scarcity, probably push, push McKee up higher in your draft. But another one, it's going to be rare you're going to find me taking a quarterback with third round draft capital. So that's why I have him this low. And then the last one, 30th pick, going Tucker Craft. Goes to the Jaguars to pick 56. He had a better sophomore year than a junior season, but uh, he's another big body tight end. It's difficult to bring down. Pairing up with Lawrence is nice, but he's a rookie tight end. So just keep that in mind. Now, obviously, a couple names you'll notice are not on this board because they were not taken at all in this mock draft. We have Josh Downs, we have Zach Evans, we have Devin Achain, we have Tank Bigsby. Those are just a few. So if you've made it this far in the video, please comment down below one player in this class that you like that wasn't included in this mock. For me personally, it's Parker Washington. I mean, I, I really wanted to see a landing spot for Washington. He's one of those later round wide receivers that I like a lot, but Hit me with yours in the comments below and have a good one. Thank you guys so much for watching.